Bellerman Zero goes out to you. Here's a story that should give you some courage that at last Jerry Brown has seen the light and that at last the governor of the state of California, the place where there's not only a, only a one-party system but virtually a no-party system with one autocrat named Jerry Brown running it, you, I've finally seen that the man has come to his senses. California sets inmate sex reassignment rules. Now you say, well, what do you mean? You're being facetious. No. Jerry Brown has set standards in the nation for determining when transgender inmates should receive state-funded sex reassignment surgery. I mean, there are standards now. They're not just going to give sex reassignment surgery to anyone who asks for it. It just shows you how centrist Jerry Brown is. There are new policies now. You see, the inmate who wants to have, well, if it's a boy, a man, wants to become a she and they want to cut it off, they have to go to prison mental health professionals. Now, of course, as you well know, prison mental health professionals are at the top of the field. They're like cruise ship doctors. You understand that. And to qualify to have the Schmendrick cut cutoff, prisoners must, must be diagnosed with what is formerly known as gender dysphoria. Now, what that means, no one knows. It was invented, of course, by the liberal psychiatric profession in order to build up yet another DSM category. There is nothing called gender dysphoria. It's an invented category, again, by the psychos who write these books. And the prisoner must have lived as a member of the preferred gender for at least 12 months. Uh-huh. Well, that's a long time. And expressed a desire for sex reassignment surgery for at least two years. Who would they have expressed it to? I don't know. I guess they could find an old email to mom saying, Dear mom, although I'm 75, I finally realized that I really have been a woman trapped in a man's body. And although I'm an ugly old man with no hair, I am going to go for sex reassignment surgery so I can live out uh, the rest of my years as a transgendered whatever I am. Has you, I don't know. Who else wants to become a tranny granny except in this country? Who would want to become a tranny granny? So I'm glad to see that Jerry Brown has instituted sex reassignment rules because I was afraid that anybody could get it. And they developed new requirements. And they were developed with uh, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. <laughs> well, some are cheering it. Flor Bermudez, detention project director at the so-called Oakland-based Transgender Law Center, that represented two psychos seeking the surgery, said it's a great victory for transgender people across the country. And I think it's a model that other jurisdictions can follow. The eight-page policy document calls for inmates who request the surgery and meet the criteria, criteria, to be referred for evaluation to a committee of two crackpot doctors, two psychopsychiatrists, two nutty psychologists, who will then make a crackpot recommendation to a, a higher-level panel of medical professionals. But hold on, don't be shocked. California is really showing restraint. The new sex inmate reassignment surgery rules prohibits procedures that are considered merely cosmetic, including hair removal, facelifts, breast augmentations, or other implants. Now, they can save that for a few years from now, when the ACLU starts suing, saying, well, you know, my client is now a woman, but what woman is not entitled to a facelift at public expense in the prisons? Or my client is now living in it as a woman, but what woman doesn't want shapely breasts? and implants provided by the taxpayers, and we, we're going to sue for that. That's the next step on the slippery slope of insanity. And now you understand the rest of the story as to why ISIS is raging across the globe. This is the Savage Nation, back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Even witches should be afraid of liberals. That's all I can tell you. If they could, they would tax the broomstick. Yeah, witches should know that. That if you let socialists take over a country, they'll tax your broomstick. We only be able to afford a broom. Now, I invented the phrase crony socialism the other day, so I threw it up on Facebook. It's got like, I know a lot of people like that one. And, you know, I was going to get to al Husani and the Muslims and the Nazis, uh, which I did yesterday before Netanyahu's famous speech. I cannot believe it. I like how they criticized Ben Carson two weeks ago for saying that if Jews had had guns, it would have altered the course of the Holocaust. It's 100% true. 
But immediately the drug addicts in the media go crazy on Ben Carson. The ones who hate guns. Oh, dare you say that? Then they get the liberal Jews from the ADL. He's crazy. Jews are afraid of guns. We're all like Larry David. We're afraid he'll go off and shoot us. No, no, it's true, though. I told you I studied this in great detail. I had a psychiatry friend, psychiatrist 20 years ago, whose parents were wiped out by the Nazis. And he sat and patiently explained to me that had every Jew had a handgun in Germany in the early 1930s, the Holocaust would have been altered. It probably, he said it probably never would have occurred. And he explained how it would have happened. See, and people say, oh, well, when the Jews stood up, they were killed anyway. Yeah, by then it was too late. And they did it with stolen guns, idiot. I mean, every, every book you ever read about Jews who survived after running into the woods, they survived it. They're stealing farmers' guns or stealing guns from soldiers who they killed. Then they could survive in the woods, you morons. They didn't survive on love and love beads. Every story of survival of Jews who fled to the woods under Hitler is about guns. They couldn't have gotten through one day without a gun. They had to steal them from farmers or kill Germans and steal their guns. Do you understand that? So anyway, to go back to the issue of had every Jew had a 22, the psychiatrist explained to me that Germany in the early days of the Holocaust was, was still a very, very orderly society. The Germans were very orderly, very neat, very clean. They didn't like disorder. And Hitler was pulling the wool over their eyes. They thought he was a miracle worker because in the early days, he was invading nations. They called him the bloodless leader because he was able to gain nations territory without killing. It was almost no German loss of life. They thought he was the Messiah. And in those early days, if the Jews had had guns, and once they started rounding Jews up, and the Gestapo came to the door, and the knock came from the men in the raincoats, and they told the Jews to pack their bags and come with them, if the, if the man of the house had said meekly, quietly, yes, sir, yes, sir, whatever, I will come with you in a moment. May I please get my bag? and get the, his wife and children together. Yes, sure, they would have let him get it. And if he came out blasting and shot the, the Gestapo in the face, knowing he would die, if every Jew had done that, they would have altered the, that would have altered the course of the, of the Holocaust because the average German in the neighboring apartments would have freaked out and known what was going on and opposed it. That's what the psychiatrist explained to me. Ben Carson is 100% right. The liberal psycho gun haters are 100% wrong. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. It is The Savage Nation. Now, if you think I'm anti-immigrant, you're a fool. You're a racist. What I've discovered is that these Hispanic mobs that spit at Trump supporters, they're the most vicious racists in the country. That's right, you heard me. And you got to give it back to them. There's a video going around of a Hispanic troublemaking, all-around bad person, screaming against Trump, wearing an insulting T-shirt. So he gets in the face with uh, one of the Trump supporters who spits in his face because people have had enough of these people who think they can come here illegally and take over the country, and they're standing up to them. That's why they support Trump. I'm telling you, you got to stand up to them. They're out of control. All of these radical groups have been empowered by Barack Hussein Obama. That's why they're acting up, because they've been empowered by the President of the United States to act up and basically take over the middle class of the country and intimidate you by bullying you. In plain old English, it's bullying. But having said that, I want to move on to another topic, which is immigration itself. Many of you say that anyone who opposes illegal immigration is a racist because you've been taught to do that to scare people. Well, I would argue that people who scream racism at every turn are the biggest racists in the country. And let me give you my position on immigration again, in case you missed it. Borders, language, culture. Borders, language, culture. Borders, language, culture. We need an orderly, legal immigration plan and program. I've said that. I'm not going to beat you up with this all over again. But I want to give you an anecdote about 
what I actually think of immigration. I went to dinner. I didn't want to drive because I had had a drink in my house, and I was warned by my son, who's ten times smarter than me, never drive when you have as much as a drink because the cops are vicious. Instead of going after the crack dealers and the murderers, they'll pull a housewife over who had a beer. We understand how that works. So I don't drive if I had a drink. I usually either have a driver or I used Uber. A woman picked me up, young lady, got me to the restaurant. That's another experience unto itself. Let me tell you all about that one another day. But when I finished the dinner, I hit the Uber app. It didn't work. I had to call my assistant to hit the Uber app on his phone to make it work. Got picked up about eight minutes later. Got in the car with Teddy. Now, every time I call Uber, I'm afraid I'm going to get a fanatical jihadi who says no dogs allowed. In which case, I'm ready to, I'm ready to fight with them. I'm telling you right now, they're not, they're not taking me over nor my country. I'd call the police before I'd give in to one of them. I tell them to go back to the hellhole he came from. If he doesn't like dogs, go back where you came from. This is America. But he didn't. Guy picks me up. He's an African. We start to talk, and we start talking about family. I figure that's something that you know all races, all countries can relate to. He was a big man, great voice. And I'm talking the ride was 11 minutes. That's all it was. And as it turns out, we talked about children and how he raises his children, how I raise my children. Very similar. Very. He's a father at home with three or four children. He's from Nigeria. And very respectful. You know, everything was yes, sir, and that kind of thing. And, you know, I find that respect generates respect in people. It's an amazing thing. Conversation stayed in a very even keel. And then when he dropped me at my house... I gave him a $20 tip. I didn't know you're not supposed to tip on Uber. I figure if a guy's working cab, he, you know, what do I care? He didn't know who I was. But I know he's a family man. He's struggling. He's raising children. He's trying to do it the right way. So I gave him a $20 tip. I'm telling you exactly the way it is. The next words were very interesting. I said to him after I gave him the tip, not before, I said, do you ever listen to talk radio? He said, yes, I do. And I saw his eyes widen when he looked focused on me. And he said, are you the great Michael Savage? He says, oh, man, I listen to you every day. He said, you are absolutely the greatest. You're like a god to me. Now, ask yourself a question. How is it that a black African male can love this show? Well, the answer is the same way a Haitian cab driver loves this show in New York City. I remember I was in New York a couple, a year and a half ago, and a Haitian drove me to WABC. Another big fan of the show. If you listen to what the media tells you, you're going to get a distorted view of reality. The only reality that you should recognize is the reality that you find in the real world. That's the world of the real, the real world, the street world. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you get this or not? So I'm saying that even, well, I guess I'm saying two things. I'm saying I'd like to see a million Africans from Nigeria who are Christians come in. See, he was a Nigerian Christian which is why he came here to work hard, why he understands America, why he fits in with America, why he loves the savage nation. Do you get what I'm saying to you? And why is Obama bringing in Syrian Muslims instead of Syrian Christians? Why is Obama kicking Syrian Christians out of the country who've been sitting here waiting for months to be accepted? I'll let you figure that one out as well. There's got to be a compatibility with the nation or the nation dies, see? A house divided cannot stand. You can't tell that to Hollywood because they're too drug-addled to understand that. They're brain-dead. They're stupid. That's why they're rallying around Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. These people are digging their own graves. How come people who are such high earners want to pay more taxes? They're insane. Liberalism is a mental disorder. Do you understand it? Ladies, pay attention to this. This is a curveball. The Army Secretary said women might soon have to register for the draft. This is intriguing. Secretary of the Army John McHugh says that he anticipates draft registration for both sexes will be approved by Congress in the near future. This is a blockbuster. If your objective is true and pure equality, then you have to look at all aspects of how women function in the military, McHugh said at a military convention in Washington, D.C. Draft registration for women would have to be approved by Congress, McHugh noted. Predicting that the change is inevitable if we find ourselves as a military with large Writ large, where men and women have equal opportunities to believe we should. Oh, boy. This is very interesting. So one of the reasons they snookered women into this equality business is to get them as dra draftees. They need cannon fodder. And if they can get it from women, they don't care. They can run women over minefields the same way they can run men over minefields. 
I'm just using it as an example. I didn't say 